let's start now our first plenary of this event. And the topic will be public-private partnerships in Latin America, solutions in all directions, in a challenge and urgency context to invest and develop infrastructure and services. More than ever, the collaboration between public and private sectors is needed and planning, construction, and operation of undertakings. For that, PPP Americas 2021 aims um, to think about uh, encompassing solutions. So I would like to bring to the floor the Subsecretary of Partnerships of the Secretariat of Projects and Strategic Actions of the State of Sao Paulo, Ms. Tarsila Reis Jordan. Welcome. I also would like to invite the Executive Director of the Promotion Agency for Private Investment, Pro Inversion, from Peru, Mr. Rafael Ugas Valinas, and also participating remotely, the National Secretary of Public Private Partnership from Panama, Ms. Mr. Sole Asvat, Senior Director of the Ministry of Finance and Public Service of Jamaica, Ms. Alicia Bish, the legal division head and deputy director of general director uh, concessions of uh, public construction works of Ministry of Chile, Mr. George Yaramilo Salmon, and the VP of the IDB countries, Mr. Richard Martinez, and he will be the moderator of this debate. Welcome, and I will turn the floor now to Mr. Richard Martinez. Thank you very much to those of you who are joining us today in the 10th edition of PPP Americas. We are holding a hybrid event, which poses, of course, challenges and at the same time advantages, that is, reaching more people in the region more efficiently, people who can join us today. Thank you to our panelists. It is an honor to be in this panel with all of you and to learn from you and from your experience. The need to transform challenges into opportunities brings us together today in order to attain uh, these breakthroughs. We need to share solutions as much as possible. And with this purpose, we're going to talk about the two key topics of the panel that are part of the IDB's roadmap map to achieve sustainable development and growth in the region, our 2025 mission to invest in the Americas. Firstly, we will talk about how we can have social, economic, and structural growth to be the driving force for the region to provide more and better hospital uh, services, parks, public lighting, roadways, ports, airports are the key to improve quality of life and more. By not investing properly in all of those areas, the costs are massive. We have to go forward investing in the economies of Latin America and Caribbean. By not doing so, it can cost up to 15 percent of the national GDP. And the second point we're going to address is how can we have the private sector as a partner to move forward? The public sector cannot move forward alone. We are sparing no efforts to confront the pandemic. Let us bear in mind that the average fiscal or tax package was 8.5 percent of the GDP and fiscal deficits 0.2 of 5 percent growth. 5% growth of the GDP in average in 2020. We must, as I mentioned earlier, look at all possible directions in seeking for more effective, innovative, and sustainable solutions. In doing so, the private sector plays a key role. And the role of the IDB group is to support this process, to uh, support the PPPs aiming at supporting the societies and the countries at all levels. And there are three key aspects to be taken into account to provide appropriate conditions for sustainable growth of the PPPs by strengthening institutional and legal frameworks. Second, preparing solid 
projects that are feasible at a social economic level, sustainable at all levels, that are uh, have fiscal responsibility and make the most of public funds that can also be attractive for the private sector. Thirdly, to produce evidence to know what works, what does not work, to generate best practices that will be shared. Finally, to share knowledge as much as possible, to learn from one another. And this is what we are seeking to do with PPP Americas, and more particularly with the excellent panel that we will open now. Thank you all once again for being here to share your experiences. Well, first, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to see here uh, the headquarters of our state administration uh, with people and also have people remotely here to talk about this debate in Brazil. Congratulations, IDB, for this event. Congratulations for choosing the state of Sao Paulo to hold this biannual meeting and for all the work behind this event. We had two years trying to put together as best as possible uh, to bring together all the panels, the, the speakers, and the topics. I also would like to congratulate uh, the team of the subsecretariats that also has proven to be wonderful to support uh, these events. First, I have to say that it is a, a pleasure and a, a huge challenge to coordinate the partnership program in the state of Sao Paulo. Such a long program that has already uh, had over 150 billion rails in investment. In our management since 2019, we have increased in 30 percent the number of projects in the state of Sao Paulo. We had eight published projects, over 19 billion in investments, and 10 billion rails in um, tax uh, benefits. For that, we have opened a front in regulatory liabilities that involved over 30 billion rails in liabilities, public and private, in an agreement with five concessionaires. So it is a great pleasure to be able to share with you, facing all the consolidated history of the state of Sao Paulo, everything that we have been able to carry out over the past three years, and which are the strategies that we implemented so that we have had uh, these wonderful results. And I think the first strategy is to uh, have a technical institutional ability to uh, hold the projects. And what I mean by that, I mean quality teams, excellence uh, people, people with experience in public and private sectors and that have the ability of working in these two worlds and also uh, advised by quality and experienced people that have the ability to understand what they hear in the market and also understand possible trends in the public sector. Our second strategy, I, I think it's about a portfolio strategy. And by strategy portfolio, I think uh, involves several layers. The first uh, portfolio strategy is choosing critical assets. And what do I mean by that? Those that are able to be pervasive in different administrations, those that make sense regardless uh, uh, in a specific agenda. That's why we choose assets that already have a resilient demand that have that uh, ability to show that that project is going to make sense over time. Also, here, I think we could say that our portfolio strategy involves diversification as well. The state of Sao Paulo traditionally has learned how to develop itself, and it developed itself with highways and mobility projects. That represented 70% of its portfolio. With the diversification rationale, we now have 50% in mobility and transportation. And we used the experience, the technology, and the concept of uh, concessions to uh, carry out other pu public policies, other assets that now can benefit 
from the concept and the rationale of a concession. So we are still working successfully on highways and mobility. And uh, you can example the example here is PIPA. We brought a sovereign fund to uh, place a bid in a project, or also we had other projects with four uh, bidders interested in that which was greatly successful. And also we had the concession of all regional airports. We have the concession for six, uh, uh, eight uh, parks. Four of them already have been granted. Also partnerships, uh, PPPs in education. This has helped us as a strategy to carry forward a diverse, interesting project and a consistent one as well. And a third strategy involves the quality of the contract. This is a very dear uh, topic for us, that is to develop a contract that will uh, be legitimate uh, and that will consider all the risks of the asset and will uh, take care of all the risks. And also, the state of Sao Paulo is doing that historically, specifically after 2016, and in our administration, we are also being very specific on these topics. And the fourth strategy to conclude a word on the process, what is transparency? We talk a lot about that. So to, to uh, be real in this transparency project, to have a data room for all the projects with all the documents in two languages, to have time enough between publishing uh, a tender notice and the bidding process, to have an institutionalized uh, conversation with the private sector. And this is n not uh, trying just to to get uh, them to converge, to get the uh, private sector to converge, but rather uh, as a habit of creating solutions to carry out a project that makes sense for one of the sides, but also to allow that th these contracts execution happen in a consistent fashion. And that's it. Thank you very much, Tarsila. Now we're going to Peru, and thank you very much for respecting time. Something that I request to our other speakers so that our audience can capture the best of each one of you. Here we have the executive director of Proe Invertir, although Brazil is a leader in PPP. Peru is a country that has strongly banned on this mechanism from traditional infrastructure sectors. We also have new players here. We have hospitals. And and treatment plants. We want to know what the experience has been up till the date. And what can you tell us about the results and the use of APPs in terms of performance and in terms of impact? Well, good morning to everyone. First and foremost, thank you very much for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to talk to you. I believe that these spaces are extremely valuable to people that are dedicated to develop PPPs. As a matter of fact, Peru has great experience in the development of PPPs for the past 20 years. We have been developing these type of PPP projects. We have adjudicated over $31 million in private investment in infrastructure projects through 94 PPP projects and another $8 billion in inactive projects or prioritizations. I would like to highlight transportation and the power sector. As Richard mentioned, the power sector is a successful case. And here we have invested $3.5 billion with thousands of kilometers of transmission line that have strengthened our system. We have the case of the electric sector. We have water and sanitation that you also mentioned, where we have been able with private investments to close the gap of water residual water 
to 100 percent. So there is 70 percent of what of residual water treatment from Lima Callao. This gap has been closed through PPP. This is something powerful because this can change the life and the quality of the inhabitants. And case number three that is successful is ports. Over $2 billion were invested in the past 20 years, and this has grown together with the exports of Brazil that sixfold in the period. Therefore, the balance of the PPPs in Peru is positive. We have indicators to demonstrate this, but we also have challenges ahead of us. We have outlined a regulatory framework of ambitious PPP in terms of structures, also um, checks and balances with more mature actions when they are launched in the market and to avoid the mistakes that we've seen in the past 20 years of experience. What is correct is is that with these new checks and balances, the projects are taking longer than what they should take, and it is necessary to strengthen capacities to structure and to implement better projects, and also to carry out adjustments to our regulatory framework so that our projects better flow, so that PPPs turn into a powerful mechanism that can contribute with our infrastructure and to close gaps in the infrastructure. And last point is the the opportunity to nourish the new portfolio projects focused on the social component of infrastructure. And after the pandemic, it is clear that we need new infrastructure in hospitals and sanitation projects and education as well. And there is a need to develop sustainable infrastructures. And this is where IADB has provided us supports in the case of hospitals, in the case of water and sanitation infrastructure. And this is, we have to see how we're going to nourish this portfolio with these new priorities that we have because of the pandemic. We should always nourish from past experience, and I go to my point. We have to see what is happening in other agencies' agendas in the region, how these matters are being approached, what payment mechanisms, what structures are being used, and we need a flexible system that will allow us to incorporate new ways of closing gaps in infrastructures with PPPs and new financing structures for the new needs ahead of us. I'm not going to extend myself, but I believe that we can continue dialoguing more. Thank you very much, Rafael, along the similar lines. Panama has done a notable job strengthening its institutional and regulatory frameworks, and they created the National Secretariat for PPPs. He, my question here for the person responsible for the Secretariat, I would like to know what are the immediate challenges that you identify for an efficient development of these projects? Thank you, Richard. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for this part for the participation. And it is excellent to see it. My colleague from Peru and we can cooperate in experience. Panama historically has a long history of PPPs. We had our concession laws and we had other projects through regulatory frameworks in 2019. We carried out a new reform using the best practice of our neighbors, importing ideas to standardize a regulatory framework that will allow us to streamline and to standardize our projects. And with this, last year, we started regulating entities. We believe that the foundation, the clear regulatory foundation and efficient is the one that will allow us to generate projects to, ta to tackle the uh, traditional infrastructure and social gaps. This being said, 
I believe that our concern in the execution of a new regulatory framework is how to you it. And this is why we have the National Secretary of PPPs. We have created it. We have used ideas from other countries. Here we have interaction between the public agencies. And we want to standardize the guidelines in the sectarial and the general sphere. And, and we also have transparency and fiscal review, like the partnership that we have with the Ministry of Finance, a team is approving projects as they arrive. With this, we've had better articulation between different institutions. And after these processes are regulated, and we count with the support of IDB, our target now is digitalization that is very important for us. And we have focused this in these months and to see all the processes. We have to give them a new meaning. It is not easy to create a PPP project. Sometimes people underestimate what is necessary in order to have a correct due diligence and to execute a proper project. At the end, the public sector wants to enable these projects, but we also need the feedback from the private sector. An example is the infrastructure and the private sectors go through due diligence and they first go through a draft project. We want to include this in the public sector. Now we have technical reports of feasibility or non-feasibility. And what we want is that when these projects reach the public entity, well, they should follow this roadmap map so that things are done efficiently. And what is important is as when we implement a legal framework, we should be able to create a project pipeline parallelly. With the support of the IDB, we have of structured advisories, advisors. This is it is a change when you go from the public sphere to the PP to PPPs. The IDB team has given us the support in the first maintenance projects in Panama, and with this we had been able to transfer knowledge thanks to the consultants that are helping us and are. And this is the pipeline that we have for this new regulatory framework. And we've had support from governments so that Panama, so Panama can strengthen it regula its regulatory framework and to develop projects where private investment is important for reinvestment. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much. Enterprise Division, Ministry of Finance, um, A number of measures geared towards strengthening the infrastructure development process have been implemented over the years. The two significant developments which I think have had a profound impact 
are the establishment of a PPP framework, as well as the implementation of a public investment management system. Now, given the challenges experienced with the quality of project planning and implementation over the years, the process of appraising and approving projects was streamlined through amendments in, implemented in 2014. Now, these legislative amendments resulted in the institutionalization of a central process for the screening and appraisal of projects to determine the viability and the appropriate modality for implementing these projects. So this system established a single entry point for all concepts, proposals, and required a comprehensive independent assessment by a team of project management experts and representatives from various areas of government to determine project viability. The system involves a multi-layered process of project screening and appraisal by the Public Investment Appraisal Branch, which is a unit within the Ministry of Finance that's staffed by persons that have expertise and qualification in project management, right? They have the responsibility to undertake a detailed assessment of project concepts and proposals. The system also involves a further review by a technical review committee, which comprises of stakeholders across the government prior to the project now being submitted to a subcommittee of cabinet. So there are different layers that the projects go through for screening and appraisal to ensure that they are viable prior to the projects being approved and implemented. So the layer of rigor, this layer of rigor introduced the need for improved planning by all project proponents and a holistic assessment which allowed for the identification of synergies and cross-sector implications and issues which are critical to ensuring the sustainability of projects. So far, the PIMS process has contributed to the improvement in the quality and sustainable of projects being implemented by the government and provides the government with a portfolio of credible projects which can be implemented to drive economic growth and deliver projects that will benefit the society as a whole. It also adds to the sustainability of the PPP program as a preliminary screening of projects is undertaken to determine the suitability of a project to be developed as a PPP. It therefore filters projects and ensures that only projects suitable for the development of a PPP are referred to the Development Bank of Jamaica for further appraisal and structuring. Now, as it relates to the PPP framework, Jamaica actually started implementing PPPs prior to the establishment of a formal policy framework. We implemented three projects, two highway and one airport concession prior to the formal framework being established. Now, whilst these projects were successfully implemented, it was deemed prudent to establish a formal framework to guide the development of PPP projects. And as such, the government of Jamaica, with the assistance of the IDB, developed a PPP policy in 2012. The policy played a critical role in ensuring the sustainability of the PPP program, as it provided a comprehensive framework which started to standardize and make clear the objectives of the program, the process involved in the development of PPP projects, as well as the stakeholders involved and their roles and responsibilities. Some of the features of Jamaica's PPP framework, which have contributed to the sustainability of the program, includes the fact that we have a dedicated unit, both in the Development Bank of Jamaica and the Ministry of Finance, that has the responsibility to manage and drive the PPP process. We, there's also focus on continuous capacity building across the public sector. So as it is important to ensure that in addition to the transaction advisors that are engaged, there is local capacity to effectively develop and manage these PPP projects. As a matter of fact, as recent as last month, we actually had a number of public sector employees who were certified in the level two APMG PPP program. So we intend to continue to improve the capacity of our public sector. There is also a dedicated enterprise team that is appointed by cabinet for each PPP project. Now the team comprise of key stakeholders, from across the, sec the public sector, and it also typically includes private sector representation. 
This together with the support of transaction advisors has resulted in the structuring of transactions that seek to balance the interests and objectives of the private and public sector. Right? And this, I think, was a critical feature in ensuring that the government met its objectives from the PPP transaction, but the transactions were also attractive to private sector, thus allowing us to attract investment and implement successful PPP projects. There is a dedicated contract management team for each PPP transaction that is implemented. And there is also commitment and support from the political directorate. So across the different administrations, we have had consistent support for our PPP program. The policy is also updated on a consistent basis to ensure that it's relevant, it takes into consideration developments in the global landscape, right? And we also seek to ensure that the process that is implemented, the process that is contained in the policy is efficient. So in concluding, Jamaica has maintained a presence in the market and has demonstrated evidence of successful PPP projects that have been implemented and have stood the test of time. We have implemented so far five PPP projects, road, airport, transshipment, valued at approximately US 1.8 billion. And this value is expected to grow as we continue to roll out our PPP program. We currently have about 14 PPP, well, 14 projects in the pipeline to be assessed to determine the suitability of implementing those projects by way of public-private partnerships. So we expect that once we go through that process of assessment, we should have some more projects coming out and adding to our, our program. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alicia. And now we will give the floor to the ministry, the head of the Ministry of Public Works in Chile, Jorge has implemented a broad concessions program for roadways, airports, hospitals, and uh, the prison system, and. Uh, some of the first concessions are now reaching uh, their deadline. And we would like to ask you, what have been the lessons learned, the takeaways, in your opinion, from this successful program? And what are the next steps uh, for the second generation of concessions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me. In fact, the PPPs in Chile have been a uh, quite successful public policy. The uh, ultimate goal was reforming the PPP regulations in 1991. And later in 1992, we started, well, the bidding process, the calls for tenders for a project located 130 kilometers away from Santiago. And since then, almost $20 million have been invested and have modernized infrastructure in the country, importantly, and promoting connectivity and productivity that were fostered. 90% of those investments were made in roadways, and there were also investments in airports, and the remainder, 12%, were shared uh, throughout different projects, uh, hospitals and uh, prisons and public roadworks, and uh, we have been Diversifying our investor portfolio, we have currently investors from 14 countries besides Chilean investors in the system. Over the 30 years' experience, the regulatory framework has evolved. It has undergone two reforms in 1996 and 2010 and has improved the designs of the contracts. And, well, the concessions have different uh, periods, deadlines, and we have also introduced the final payment to the concessionaire, to the grantor, by the residual amounts obtained by the states, those proceeds. I would like to mention three examples that are key, uh, three takeaways. The first takeaway is the need to have clear rules and clear dispute settlement mechanisms for the system to operate properly. And through the PPP mechanism, we aim to meet public needs through these partnerships 
with the public sector, and the system seeks to uh, take into account the private sector's needs and the civil society needs, uh, also aiming at profitability results from the investments and risks that are taken and providing good quality services and infrastructure to the population through those investments. And in fact, um, these are the ultimate goals of the process. And I should also point out it's key to have clear rules in place at a broader level in regards to the legal framework and the regulatory framework uh, for PPPs. We also need to set clear rules in relation to the contracts and the dispute settlement mechanisms where the rules will be also set in place. In regards to Chile, the PPPs have uh, complied with uh, the arbitration system of the dispute settlement mechanism, and it has supported uh, both stakeholders. And this is something that has become relevant when it, when it comes to indemnizations um, that were put in place from the concessionaires. At times, uh, construction works were stopped during the arbitration process, uh, and, now, and these processes are now more agile. In 2010, where the arbitration process actually suspended the work, so technical panel was put in place to expedite the process. Of course, disputes might arise. There might be inevitable. We're talking about complex projects, and there have there has been a drop in disputes after the mechanism was set up. We also need to talk about flexibility in long-term projects. We need to also consider the fact that the, well, the needs and the preferences of citizens change over time. And therefore, we should also take those needs into account. In this regard, bringing together the private sectors and the citizens' interests, well, uh, have made us adopt a regulated system. The contracts have to be as accurate as possible and to provide for uh, all the possible consequence consequences and results that might stem from the process. Both parties are accountable. There is transparency in terms of uh, the flexibility that is tied to every contract. And we believe that all of these things contribute to conciliating public and private interests by providing more assurance to the system, more guarantees. And Chile has been successful in this regard. Secondly, I would mention that projects are meant for citizens. It's not only about building infrastructure. Projects that are executed through PPPs should seek to meet the needs of uh, citizens, of the citizenship, meaning we should focus on three key aspects. By providing infrastructure projects, we should also focus on the services that are provided to users. And here, there's a shared responsibility between the state the state designs the contracts that are uh, then incorporated. In Chile, since 2020, contracts also take into account uh, the regulations regarding services. And on the private sector side, there's also a critical aspect in regards to uh, uh, the functions, the responsibilities that are assigned to them. And since late 19s, the tariffs paid on urban roadways correspond to 3.5%. And this has also caused users to have a positive uh, view of the tariffs, they were, the fees they were paying, which were low. But over the years, and as the prices were increased, they became unsustainable, and users, in a recent agreement between concessionaires and the state, 
no longer have to pay for the actual increase in fees, and the concessions have longer uh, terms, longer contracts. We all beyond going beyond the effective infra infrastructure services. We should also focus on intergenerational equity. There are different levels of services that reach different levels of the population, and there are costs that are not tolerable. It does not seem fair, on the other hand, for investments that will last over a 50-year period to be funded, financed by users that will have access to such services for 25 years. Therefore, we have implemented a new instrument to this structure. For the next concession to take over some of the uh, burdens. And I should also mention, well, the environmental responsibility and the citizen participation, which is key to prevent posterior conflicts or disputes. And the third takeaway that is also very important is related to the governance system of the PPP system. Creating a PPP policy, well, should have a long-term view and focus on professionalization in seeking to provide proper design and execution of projects in Chile. We have achieved consensus in terms of the benefits of the PPP system, and therefore we have now con long-term contracts despite the changes of government. So we have an institutional approach, and there are institutions that actually are in charge of governance. In back in 2017, Chile created the General uh, Agency for PPPs for concessions, and we have five-year cycles for these portfolios, and the officials are appointed based on their technical skills. And well, I've talked about the challenges that we have addressed through three different agendas from the General Concessions Office. First, we have an agenda for sustainable investments and the tools that were created by the financial market for PPPs were admired over a long period of time and should be revised particularly when it comes to financing sustainability projects to attract more institutional investors and new stakeholders by identifying improvements in the contract design leading to sustainable and green certification to the projects that will be added to the portfolios, to the contracts as citizen participation, zero carbon, among others. Secondly, we have an agenda for transparency in seeking to advance transparency to citizens, to the civil society, in terms of the amount and the quality of the data that is shared. And we have recently find an agreement with the NGO uh, Fiscal Observatory, Observatorio Fiscal, to set up a, a database that will be open to cit citizens and standardized, easy to use. Thirdly, we have an agenda on the PPP's uh, relations or ties with citizens. There's a low perception uh, or low awareness of the benefits uh, the system can provide because 30 years ago, a lot of people became used to having top quality infrastructure and they uh, have no actually grounds for comparison uh, to what the state is providing at the moment. So these are the, this is the negative side, so to speak. You have, for instance, the roadways and the tolls, the toll fees that also has an impact on the family income. And at this point in time, we're going to open a discussion on how we can enhance this inter interaction with uh, civil society, with uh, different stakeholders 
in seeking to minimize the impact of uh, the uh, improvements or construction works in different sites. And for instance, we we should either make improvements to the environment or surrounding areas, or maybe the profits uh, uh, will be shared to have a profit sharing mechanism with the communities. And however, this mechanism is very important. We are, are now calling for tender now uh, this year for uh, important amounts. In Chile, we have now experience in this regard, and the last, the latest projects have been well received. There's a high interest. We have, uh, we are competitive. One of the most relevant projects had uh, seven bidders two months ago, and we also face challenges with infrastructure uh, projects, hospitals, roadways, uh, ports, airports, trains, and. Uh, we, uh, of course, need to make progress in all of these areas in Chile. Thank you very much, Jorge. And, well, I am sorry to interrupt you. Your ideas, well, the ideas you've shared are very clear. However, I'd like you to ask the second question I have for you regarding in relation to the future projects. And if you may, and with all due respect, we also need to ask a question to our other panelists. And we'd like to thank you for your participation and for sharing so many interesting uh, things about the projects in Chile. We have now we are going to turn to the other questions we have for Tarsila before we adjourn. Has developed 20, 52 concessions projects and uh, generated a total value of PPP projects over 100 billion Brazilian real. What are the main lessons learned along the way? In Tarsila, what project or contractual in innovations have been helped you? to continuously improve project development and uh, delivery. Olha, eu acho que Well, to talk about innovation, which are the innovations and how they work and why they work well. I think that uh, you know before talking about innovations, we have to talk about two prerequisites and discussing innovations. The first prerequisite is not having, uh, is not being uh, amazed about innovation. Innovating can be good or bad. And I think that before innovating, I think we have to integrate uh, and we have to to have a distance of how things are, are, are being done. We have to look at things at a distance. Uh, and so then we can create an innovation that is not a pain, but rather it's a tool to address, to, to solve problems. I think this is the first step in terms of attitude regarding innovation. Second, and uh, something that I, I think is very important, is to ponder on risks, to discuss innovations, to innovate in PPPs in the public sector. That's not uh, something trivial because we have a strong control, a strict control of the public sector, and we need to convince uh, a whole number of players, uh, different agencies, uh, many people that are involved. And in, so, you know, that, that innovation makes sense. So to innovate with a high risk, so, you know, the project might not work and without being sure that th that once again is a tool to solve problems and to improve the quality of, of a certain sector and not only to be a pain, as I said. I think the, we need to make it very clear that this this risk consideration needs to be taken into consideration for innovation. After these two prerequisites, I think that we can, you know, main highlight the uh, many of the innovations the state of Sao Paulo is developing under the rationale of 
innovation customization in the project contracts. And why am I saying customization? Because the standardized contracts, we talk a lot about that. Let's standardize contracts. Let's have a contract that is for Sao Paulo. This is good because it makes uh, our everyone's lives easier because, you, you know, you don't have to go over the contracts all the time. But to innovate in a standardized fashion, it, it just doesn't work. So I think to foster the regulatory creativity, depending on the different assets, and then to be able to uh, apply that when it makes sense, that's fine. But it's very important to limit innovation creation for a, a given asset. And then I will give you a few examples that I think were very interesting here under this rationale. And lines eight and nine, we had a very specific demand protection for the pandemic, one year protection. We called it gold protection. If there was a drop in demand uh, during the process or the rationale of contingency investment that was created in the team in order to optimize the structuring of IDB and saying, look, these investments will only and happen and if they happen if the contract the, the state will have to renegotiate this contract or the free price rationale for assets that are not submitted into the traditional contract with regulated uh, affairs like parks all the parks program that developed this free uh, price rationale and that's going to make uh, are very easy to execute this contract because uh, it addresses the possibilities of unbalances or a discount by frequent users in the case of the highways that allows to address the mode tariff policy without uh, going to tariff populism. And so that is uh, an innovative approach or also zero carbon addressing the agenda of a greater needs in, in sustainability and the environment. From then on, we have another innovation aid, uh, agenda that is out of the regulatory one, but it, it is more related to technology. It's technology innovation. So it, it makes sense to have the North Rodeau project uh, 94 kilometers that is going to complete the road anel in Sao Paulo. And this will be the first free flow highway in Brazil. So it makes sense for that asset. It makes a sense in a project such as tech to face the demand risk issue and create a project of uh, payment per availability. Or it makes sense to integrate all the rationale of IRAP in uh, highways. So I think after we uh, go after, you know, we go item by item in, in the pre-innovation stage, uh, each one of the projects uh, needs uh, to analyze what makes sense for each one of the assets. And I think Sao Paulo State has a number of examples that and we can discuss them, and, but we would need another panel to go into the details. Thank you, Tarsila, for your answer. Now we will go back to Peru. For us as a bank, the transparent infrastructure development is clear, and competition is the best way to guarantee this transparency. Rafael, could you tell us what have you been doing in Peru to strengthen your transparency mechanism when you develop infrastructure projects, especially when you have PPPs? So thank you, Richard, again. I am going to keep to my time. If I exceed myself, remind me. Nonetheless, this is an extremely important point. As you mentioned, the regulatory framework of our of the Peruvian PPP has evolved throughout the last 20 years. And although it has always considered competition and transparency today in the current legal framework. Both themes 
guide all of our projects which contemplate PPPs. So to carry out competitive and transparent process has always been a target for Pro Inversión. This is why we have perfected all of these processes pursuing the improvement of everything. It is obvious in Peru and is aware how international corruption scandals that have involved major construction companies in the regions, how they have affected the infrastructure sec sector and also the PPPs in this sense. This is from some years ago, but we're still recovering from its effects. And uh, there is a need to take action in order to counteract against these effects and to recover the trust in the infrastructure sector. And this regulatory framework with its changes adds greater requirements and greater levels of approval with the approval of a number of actors that because we want to check we want to checks and balance system that makes sense in order so that these projects are mature when they reach the market but of course this will add transaction costs when we incorporate these new demands and we will see that this is impacting the time that it takes to develop these projects. Therefore, there are opportunities for improvement and optimization within our processes that want to be competitive and transparent. But we don't want this to affect the quality of the projects and the services that are rendered. And we want PPPs to continue having as a role in infrastructure and in service and major projects in the country. We, in terms of competition, there are processes where we have spaces so that interested the stakeholders can analyze the contracts, the data. We are sounding the market because we want new rounds to incorporate new comments. And I believe that advertisement is the rule and confidentiality is an exception. This is a result of the experience of Pro Inversión. We have standardized bases that allow us to give predictability to those that are interested. And these databases are updated. Rafael, could you please end your comment? because we have our other speakers. A final idea here would be our databases. We perfect and then adapt it. Throughout the pandemic, we had to do this so because we don't want to close this window. Now the challenge is how to have a transparent and competitive system that achieves the objectives of having infrastructure at the service of the population because the cost of not having infrastructure is high. And we've seen this throughout the pandemic. And, the, and Jorge's comment, how to count with regulated flexibility I believe that we need regulated flexibility in a number of levels in the execution of the contracts and the system and the development of these PPPs. Thank you very much. I thank you very much. And now we will go to Panama. And I thank you for being straight to the point. What challenges and opportunities do you implement? Do you identify when you implement projects under the new legal framework? 
including these subjects or the themes that we've seen in terms of social infrastructure. Therefore, I help. I thank you. My colleagues have talked about this, and for Panama, as I mentioned, Panama has an experience of PPP projects. Our strategy has been to plan projects from of the first generation that are of our horizontal infrastructure because we want to learn what happened last year and this year. And we are reviewing horizontal projects that allow us to standardize projects and contracts because what we want is to know the procedures and the requirements that are needed for properly structured projects and social needs here connected to the PPPs go hand in hand with what has been done in Chile and Peru. We also have vertical, vertical constructions like hospitals, schools, and possibly a program of school maintenance. And with this, we can simplify what the government can do. And I am saying that in addition to mobilizing private capital and bringing efficiencies to the PPPs, at least in our legal framework, uh, well, we see things in the long term. We always talk about the complexities of these PPP projects regarding due diligence that is necessary, but these projects are of 10, 15 years in average, and we have to think about the oversight. And this is why the monitoring of these KPIs are cleaved. And my last comment would be, this is what PPPs can provide us in the long term. process to guarantee this fiscal sustainability and how uh, PPP can contribute to it. Thank you, Richard. So in an effort to make the response as concise as possible, I'll just focus on the two main strategies that Jamaica has focused on to manage fiscal sustainability as it relates to public-private partnership transactions. So one of these strategies that we have used is actually to legislate particular limits on the value of PPP transactions that can be implemented, right? So specific limits were legislated for PPPs that could be undertaken by the government. A ceiling of 3% of GDP was implemented for user pays PPPs with effect from April 1st, 2014 to March 31st, 2017. This ceiling was increased to 8% with effect from April 2017 to March 31st, 2026. And the legislation also allows for further increase in the ceiling in the event that we're able to reduce the public debt to GDP below 60% 60, below 60 of GDP. Now, only projects that have been implemented subsequent to the establishment of the enhanced fiscal rules in 2014 are managed under the ceiling. So to date, we're only monitoring the cost associated with one project under that ceiling, and we have utilized approximately 2% of the legislative ceiling. So there is adequate space for us to accommodate additional user-based projects. Now, in keeping with the requirements of IPSAS, liabilities related to government pays PPPs are included as part of the government's debt stock. And as such, fiscal exposure to government pays PPP are managed under the legislative target to reduce the debt to GDP ratio to 60% by 2027-28. Now, in addition to implementing legislative limits or ceilings on the value of PPP projects, we have also focused on implementing project commercially viable PPP projects which have contributed to the development, expansion, and modernization of public infrastructure. 
These projects have not resulted in any direct fiscal exposure to the government, but alternatively have contributed significantly to infrastructure development, economic growth, and has also provided returns to the government in the form of concession fees generated on an annual basis. There are currently a number of government PSPPP projects in the pipeline, which will have a direct fiscal impact, as they will require payments from the government and government obligations under these contracts will form part of the debt stock. Notwithstanding the implementation of these projects, will be managed to ensure that commitments under these projects will not derail the government's fiscal program. Once implementation by way of a PPP demonstrates greater value for money, it is anticipated that these investments will contribute favorably to economic growth and provide the improved deliver delivery and critical infrastructure, public serve infrastructure and public service, and as such, form an important part of the government's program. So the strategy of focusing on commercially viable projects and implementation of the limits on the value of PPPs that can be implemented has served Jamaica well in the management of fiscal sustainability, and it has paved the way for us to take on other projects, including the projects that are not commercially viable, but will play a significant role in providing critical infrastructure and services to the population. Thank you, thank you very much, Alicia. Muchas gracias a todos por su generosidad. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Muito obrigado. As I said, we are before situations.